welcome to another good evening everyone and welcome to another webinar from isfgs hopefully the last one for this 2022 uh, calendar year um i have to welcome you all but also uh, remind you that on sunday at 10 a.m est argentina is going to be playing the finals of the world cup and as you can see in my background we got the best player in the world so for my Brazilian colleagues uh, that have not joined yet or will join, I hope they don't mind that I keep it as my background. Um, having said that, I think that the speaker we have tonight does need much introduction. I can say that it's been a role model for hundreds, if not thousands of surgeons. Uh, he's been the pillar how Cleveland Clinic has built operations in the state of Florida. He's been, uh, I would say, clinician, academician, researcher, but more important than anything else, he's been a dear, dear friend of mine. Um, and um, he's probably one of the top uh, three colorectal surgeons in the world. And I would say when it comes to fluorescent image guided surgery, one of the two uh, that have been pushing the envelope and helping us build ISFGS. Uh, as a society that counts now with over 1,500, close to 2,000 members. I encourage for those of you who have not joined yet the society to do so. It's still for free. We don't know when, but at some point we're going to flip the switch and there's going to be a charge. There is plenty that you can enjoy from our website. So please get on the website, join us uh, and participate. So without any further delay, I have Fernando Dip, our executive director, who just joined from Argentina, as well, and Electra McDermott, who is also our administrator uh, of the society on the call. And I thank all of them for a spectacular year uh, filled with education, with research. And uh, without any further delay, Steve Wexner. All right. Thank like you. Like for well. you. <laughs> thank you, my dear friend. And uh Absolutely. Having my much better half also as an Argentinian, I fully applaud the choice of background. And uh, as, as a gringo from U.S., looking forward to uh, seeing my, uh, well, not seeing it live, but being in the country in the final, during the final. So that's, uh, Bravo. Be, I'm sure I'll see uh, Fernando yelling at the top of his lungs, vamos Argentina. Um, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen, follow your kind introduction and see if we can get going with the talk on fluorescence imaging. So what is the evidence for fluorescence guided imaging in, um, in colorectal surgery? If we think about firstly fluorescence, because I don't know people's background uh, on the call, the 50 or so people who've logged in so far, the 300 who've registered, fluorescence basically is defined on this slide and I, I won't read the slide, but the, these are the basic, basic concepts of what we use now in clinical practice near infrared fluorescence imaging. And it's been around for 60 plus years. It's a compound that's bound to albumin. So it's great for uh, staying in the vessels for uh, being able to illuminate through angiography. It's non-toxic, it's non-ionizing. It's hepatic clearance very rapidly. So you can have repeated applications. Um, it, there is a cross-reactivity, albeit small, uh, to uh, iod iodine uh, compounds, uh, shellfish, iodine, and I always ask patients about any allergies, but even then it depends how much you need to use it and what kind of allergy they have. So basically, when you look at the, the spectrum of light, as opposed to white light, it, it's shifted a little bit in emission, and that gives us a, a penetration into the blood vessels to see what's happening with perfusion. What does that really mean? Well, the anesthetist would inject generally anywhere two to three and a half cc's of ICG followed by a quick 10 cc flush. And usually within a matter of 30 to 90 seconds, we'll get fluorescence coming out. And this is an old uh, model uh, of an external scope, nothing laparoscopic, external camera rather. So when um, the, uh, low, the light source puts a near infrared uh, wavelength light on blood vessels, that what will come back as transmitted fluoresces. Now, 
generally it's thought of as green, although it can be dialed into any color you like, or you can look at it as an actual angiogram and you can look at the vessels. In colorectal surgery, there's a variety of uses, the most common of which is perfusion assessment, and I'll go into that first, but there's others, lymph nodes, ureters, nerves, peritoneal metastases, liver metastases, and undoubtedly other, other applications. But perfusion assessment is where it really all started. I can get this move forward, we'll be in good shape. Huh, that's not good. No worries, we can wait. While we yeah. are starting, I wanna remind all the participants to feel free uh to send me questions either with a qa or with a chat uh, so that i can interrupt steve as he presents and ask him questions that pertain to his to his slides uh so don't be shy ask questions if needed be open your microphone uh so that we can um let me stop this an interactive session we have already 64 participants uh, take I'm your time, Steve. Just reopen the presentation because there's no problem. Some no problem. problem uh, we have computer. 64 participants from all Latin American countries. Uh, if you guys are calling or asking questions, please identify yourself. Where are you sending your question from? Some of you guys we know where you're asking from, some others we don't. Okay, I'm going to try and show this video that Fernando and, and you and everyone else made for. Go for I, it. Yes, we can see it. We can I, see it very nicely. Yeah, I've just got to get the um, image to full screen again. And we'll see if we can get it. You can play probably on that view. It might play. I don't know why it's not playing. This, this is taking a while to load. I think that's what the problem is with this video. Let me see if it doesn't load, I'll, I'll skip it. It's, it's unfortunate because it really shows very nicely how when the ICG is given, there's a very clear area of demarcation of the colon. Um, and I always try and go about, if it's the proximal margin, I'd like to see bright green, like two centimeters distal to that margin. If it's the distal margin, I wanna see it going proximally by about two centimeters. Yeah, this video, unfortunately, for whatever the reason, is not playing today, which is too bad. So let me, um, ah, something just happened there. Just when I hit escape and now it disappeared altogether. Sorry, guys. Number of participants continues to go up, so don't worry. All right, well, uh, I'm just concerned that it's not playing the way it should. So it did eventually take some time. Okay, let's try again. And maybe I get it playing before I go to screen share. Let's see if that'll work. Last time, last try. Let's give it one more shot. Again, yeah. if you guys have questions during the presentation through the chat or Q&A, don't hesitate to ask. And um, just... identify yourself where you're asking questions from, which is also very important. Okay, it seems that it wants to work. Um, so, share screen. Nope, now it's gone away altogether. This is crazy. All right, uh, third time's the charm. Video. Fernando, yeah. while, while Steve is uh, rebooting the presentation, tell me how often do you guys use perfusion and geography during colorectal surgery? at the university hospital or in the Otamendi hospital? Well, here in Argentina, we are uh, starting to use it uh, routinely. Uh, it's not totally uh, approved uh, to solve the ICG here. We are getting there, uh, but we are using it in the, in the university hospital now uh, every single day that we are uh, performing a surgery. Yeah, and I'll say that I use it routinely on every left-sided resection, every colorectal coloanal anastomosis. I use it selectively in other settings, such as the right colon. Um, but this is just not happening for whatever the reason. Well, you um, can keep going on with a regular presentation. Yeah, I'm just going to skip the video because this oh, is yeah, a absolutely. waste of everybody's time. Um, yeah. 
evidence of ICG will open yet again, and we'll just skip past the video and go to some of the literature, and that should be a bit easier. So screen share again. You can watch all these videos if you become a member and log in to isfgs.org, our website, as all these videos available for you and also to your patients. In case you want to promote yourself, we have, all, we have also um, a portal that your patient can find you if you use fluorescent image guided surgery during surgery. Dr. Wexner. Yeah, ahead, so sir. I'm sorry, you'll have to go to the ISFGS YouTube. The, that was actually a ploy to get people to become members because it's the only way they're going to see that video is by joining, uh, which since it's free, there's no reason not to. And then you can see the video. So the first study we did in the U.S. was this PILLAR-2 trial, perfusion assessment and laparoscopic and left-sided anterior section, which was a multi-center initiative. Uh, it was run by Mike Stamos uh, from University of California, Irvine. Uh, Dr. Jafari was Mike's research fellow, um, and we had the highest enrollment in, in the trial here at Cleveland Clinic, Florida, and there are others involved, uh, Beth Israel in New York and, and uh, Kaiser. West LA, the, the Ochsner Clinic, um, USC, and, and other sites. And you can see what the aims of the study were. Um, basically, it was a feasibility study. And the secondary endpoints were more of the safety endpoints, clinical leak, radiologic leak, uh, and any other complication that might occur. And the first thing that, that struck us is that its Im image acquisition was almost 100%. Secondly, it changed the surgical plan in roughly 6% in the low risk group and 7.5% in the high risk group. Now, what is low risk and high risk? It's what's generally used in the colorectal literature when you're designing studies that a low risk anastomosis is above 10 centimeters and the patient's not had pelvic radiation, and a high risk anastomosis is under 10 centimeters uh, and or the patient's received radiation. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag there. And the ICG actually altered our surgical plan in a couple of percent. It doesn't tend to offer it by, uh, alter it by much. The median alteration was one and a half centimeters. The mean was three centimeters. Uh, but there's some outliers. Here's one where it's a 14 centimeter difference and, and you know, one where it's only half a centimeter. But these one and two centimeter levels can be the, dis the difference between a leak and no leak, right? I mean, all you need is that little devascularized area. You have an anastomotic leak. I like to think of the ICG as an early warning system. So that 14 centimeter case, for example, is, is one in which you'd look at it to the naked eye and look fine. You have the ICG perfused and you find out it's really not perfusing. And so you say, well, let's do something else, irrigate, uh, put in the drain, whatever, and then come back. And by the time you go back, now it's more apparent to the naked eye. However, Without the ICG, you wouldn't still be there. You would have closed and left in the OR and the patient would have a leak or a stricture. So I think it calls your attention that, hang on, not all is well here, we need to rethink things. And, and inevitably over time, the visual cues to white light catch up with the ICG, but the ICG saves us from having problems. And I think the, the proof is in the pudding. When we look at the anastomotic leak rates of 1.2% in the low risk group and 2% in the high risk group. Now for reference, the anastomotic leak rate in various meta-analyses, systematic reviews for, for high risk anastomoses is anywhere 10 to 15%. There are some higher ones, but then there's some lower ones, but that seems to be where it centers, 10 to 15%. So what's been achieved here is a decrease by almost an order of magnitude in the leak rate. So here's how we did the trial. And I mentioned this before, white light, you kind of see what's going on here. With the SPY image, which is the true perfusion assessment, the angiographic image, it's white. With near infrared fluorescence, it's green. And you can see this is a view of the mucosa after the anastomosis has been fired. Now, other surgeons have had similar findings. Frederick Risk put together a consortium, just like we had in the US from different sites. Frederick put together sites, his from Geneva, uh, Neil Mortens and Chris Cunningham, uh, Ian Lindsay, and, and so on, uh, Bruce George from Oxford, and then uh, uh, Ronan Cahill from, from, uh, all, from Ireland, from Dublin. Their study was different because it wasn't just left side and low intersection. It was all, all comers. So they had right colons, high intersection, low intersection. 
There, but their overall leak rate was 2.4%, and the high anterior section rate was 2.3, not terribly different than our 1.9%, pretty much the same. And again, drastically lower than what's in the literature. Um, ICG has been used during robotic surgery, and it's one of the great things about the robot that you can just see the ICG, the Firefly system, right then and there. Um, which, of course, you can with the laparoscopic cameras, too. Now, they're all pretty much equipped with ICG mode, uh, but you can see the difference it makes robotically. So without fluorescence imaging, the leak was 5.2%. With fluorescence imaging, 0.6%. So again, just like the other studies I showed you, it's about an order of magnitude decrease in the rate of anastomotic leakage in this study of 657 patients. Um, there's a study out of Spain where they looked at Luigi Boni's study from Italy. And Luigi is one of the leads of the European uh, chapter of the ISFGS uh, from uh, Korea and, and, and so on. You know, almost just the point here touching, almost to the point of favoring ICG. And this isn't many studies, this is 555 patients. Um, there's a more recently a propensity match scoring, um, 253 ICG, 253 no ICG, reducing by half the incidence of anastomotic leak, mostly in total mesorectal excision by using ICG. Uh, now, the one outlier, the one fly in the ointment here is this very strange study called Pillar 3. And I, I must say, I can mea culpa. I, I designed the study uh, back when Novadac was the company who owned the technology that was acquired by Stryker. And when Novadac owned it, um, we designed a study. I, I was their chief medical officer at the time. We designed a study meant to include a thousand patients. Um, and then the company was sold and I had nothing further to do with the trial. And lo and behold, not, the trial didn't enroll the lower threshold of 450. It didn't enroll the anticipated number of 1,000. Instead, it enrolled under 400 patients. So no surprise there that the leak rate was just under what the literature cites, 10 to 15% in both groups. So the problem is, is insufficient sample size. The study was prematurely terminated. So the value of the data are fairly meaningless to say the least. Um, but when we look away from that study, we can find with that single exception of that study, every other study showing tremendous value of ICG. And we have this one uh, from Annals of Surgery based on, an a, uh, on a, uh, a, a meeting that we had initially in, in Frankfurt, Germany, just before COVID and around October, November of 2019, when people from ISFGS got together and started working on these consensus statements that uh, Fernando, Raul, and, and Kevin White uh, led the effort on these studies, and Electra did all of the heavy lifting on the data and publications. And you can see what the consensus was. It should be used. There's no doubt. This modified Delphi study of global experts and across all disciplines in surgery from around the world, uh, what, it, what it showed us. So perfusion, I think, is absolutely an essential part of any left-sided or anterior section or anastomosis. Personally, I look at the donuts and I use ICG and I do an air leak test uh, and I do direct visualization with flexible sigmaroscopy. I do what's called quadruple assessment. Um, Steve, let me let me interrupt you here, if I may, for sure. a second. So tell us how much do you inject? Uh, when do you inject? Uh, for how long does it last? And the last question is, how many times can you inject? Um, so in terms of, of the amount injected, uh, generally... Um, three and a half uh, cc's. Um, you, you really, as our statements show, you should do by weight, but generally it comes out to about three and a half cc's. 10 cc uh, flush within 30 to 60 seconds of when you want to look at the area. You can repeat it as often as you like because it's rapid hepatic excretion with minimal toxicity. Great, great. I, I have 78 participants and there are two questions 
guys get on your chat and ask me questions please tell me where are you calling or asking from arturo mendez i guess he's from chile is the blood pressure important when you do evaluation of the perfusion is what important the blood pressure of the patient um i you know i, I mean if the patient is hypotensive i don't think we're probably meant to be doing icg we've got other problems going on in the or um, and if they're hypertensive, I suspect it might just circulate more quickly. Um, but generally speaking, the patients are, are normotensive and we try and maintain normothermia in them as well. Sounds good. Sean Liu on the colorectal surgeons at UC San Diego. Wonderful to be part of this forum. Question for Dr. Wexner. Currently, I use ICG routinely for my colon resections for perfusion and for urethral identifications. What's your experience with ICG, not only study arterial phase enhancement, but as a way to predict venous congestion if clearance isn't as robust as you expect? Yeah, that's an excellent question, certainly. And it's, it's work in progress. Number one, we don't have quantification for arterial perfusion. But number two, we don't really have a sense of what it means when there's delayed emptying. What's delayed to you know, to 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 uh dr lu might be considered normal to me so we these are both areas it was great great question uh dr lu but th these are areas that we're working on to try to quantify the perfusion assessment or, and the arterial phase and then to try to figure out what um venous outflow means so both areas in progress, but I think you can get a good gestalt when it just doesn't leave, right? It's not supposed to be there 10 minutes later, for example. Two more questions, Dr. Sungrim Han. I don't know where from. Please guys, tell me where you're calling from. And uh, Omero Rodriguez from Panama, both want to know, what about quantitative analysis? Uh, how can you quantify perfusion? Yeah, that's what I just mentioned a moment ago, Raul, that you know, we're working on ways of quantification. I say we, I think every company that manufactures the imaging device uh, is trying to get their device to be able to quantify. I think it can be done. It's a matter of just uh, algorithms uh, based upon light intensity and, and, and time of intensity, it's the depth and the time of the intensity. The question is, what do you do with the data? And although it'll be very nice, it may be like one of those features in your car that it's kind of nice to have, but you don't really use it. If, if, if I'm told that the uh, intensity is, let's say the scale becomes 100, and I'm told the intensity is 90, does that yeah. mean 10% chance it's going to leak? I, you know, We have to ultimately have a big enough data set that we can say at this value, the chance of a leak is X and the chance of no leak is you know, above this level, the chance is X. Below this level, the chance is Y. So I think we have to establish parameters and that just becomes very, very large test and ultimately validation data sets, which, which we will eventually get to, but it's going to take time. The, yeah. the other problem is right now, intensity, at least to our naked eye, and, and, and I can't think it'd be any different looking at the pixels and converting those into just uh, data. Um, it varies by the focal length of the camera, by the angle of the camera to the bell, uh, and by the amount of time that's elapsed since the since the injection. So you know you can get a thirty degree camera. It maybe looks a little different than a zero degree, depending on how you're holding it to the bell. Is it truly a right angle or not? How close are you? Has to do with the depth of penetration. So all these these issues will be worked out. Agreed. Now, um, before we move on to the next uh, topic, for the rookies and the newcomers, with fluorescent imaging, you can see perfusion. And that is angiography or lymphangiography that we're gonna hear in a second, or excretion, which could be the ureters through the kidneys or the biliary tree through the liver. And there is a, a last uh, phenomenon with fluorescent imaging, which is autofluorescence, which is mainly a rearm of the endocrine surgeon and those who are working on nerve autofluorescence. So the next subject is uh, lymph node identification and mapping, lymphangiography. Steve. So um, we'll go on to this area next. And um, you can see here use of ICG for sentinel nodes. 
and this article calls it being a game changer. Um, and basically, there's not a whole lot of studies, not a whole lot of patients. It's really, as we had with the Pillar 2 study, it becomes a feasibility study showing that with these various doses, and I mentioned three and a half cc's here, it's one to four cc's, half a cc. There's a lot of heterogeneity in how much is injected. There's a lot of heterogeneity in how it's injected. Is it laparoscopic, extraperitoneal? In other words, on the outside of the bowel. Is it um, endoscopic on the inside of the bowel? When do you do it? Here's one which is ex vivo, in fact. Um, and the sensitivity is all over the map. So a lot of potential for detection rate, but not a lot of um, homogeneity in terms of the quantity injected, the method of injected or injection or the timing of injection. But ultimately, these, these 11 pool studies, for example, um, show um, mapping 91%. Detection of lymph node metastases, specificity, roughly two thirds. So, not ideal yet. I mean, again, very much a work in progress. Um, however, for the sentinel node, it may be a little bit better than just all nodes. And, and seems to be perhaps not surprisingly, uh, detection rate is, is, is higher than the accuracy rate or the sensitivity. Um, <laughs> Steve, I have to stop you for a second before we continue with lymph node, because I think there are two important questions here. One is coming from Homero Rodriguez from Panama, the other one from Ernesto Navarro, I don't know from where. And they're saying if to decrease the number of leaks, it wouldn't be useful either to do endoscopy or to develop a special kit. I have to say, how about taking pictures of anastomosis? And using a computerized program with artificial intelligence that might recognize areas of leak, areas of ischemia that the human eye doesn't recognize uh, otherwise. Yeah, I mean, it, again, all of these things are possibilities. None are here now. And for any of them to prove uh, standard of practice, there have to be huge amounts of data input to know that what you're looking at is really valid and will make a difference in the impact to the patient. So again, it's like you know the car, you can get a lot of nice features, bells and whistles, but you don't really necessarily need them. I think we'll get to it. Um, I don't think you need to take a picture, it'll be real time, but we're not there yet. Right now, right. it's relying upon the naked eye. And until such time as we have data that says, if your perfusion level is below X, your leak rate is Y. Or if your perfusion level is above this number, your leak rate is Z, right? I mean, that's what right. you need. Got it. So the, the, let's, let's, let's go back to the lymph nodes. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the for us um, in colorectal surgery, we always do a high ligation. So again, the actual lymph nodes don't really change what we do. We're not going to go after different nodes. We're doing a high ligation of the inferior mesenteric artery between the aorta and the left colic artery for rectal lesions, for sigmoid lesions. We're doing a ligation of the ileocolic vessel at the superior mesenteric for right colon. The only area where it potentially could change is the transverse colon, where depending on whether it's going towards the right colic or the middle colic, you might alter which vessels you're taking. The area where it has a bigger impact potentially is lateral pelvic lymph nodes, because operating in lateral pelvic lymph nodes in Asia is sort of routine. But of course, patients have a body mass index of 18 to 21, and you can see the nodes. Very different in our country, which, which as you know from your field, Raul, with, with you know, just rampant runaway morbid obesity, uh, it's not so easy to see or operate on these lateral pelvic lymph nodes. And therefore, if we had a way to image the lymph nodes, we could know, do we need to take them all out? Do we need to take them selectively out? Or can we not take them at all? So using ICG, there was less blood loss, presumably because of less dissection, and a larger number of nodes harvested, presumably because of accuracy. So I think the sweet spot there is the lateral node. It's not the standard node. Now, it was just already mentioned about ureteric visualization. And we just, uh, we recently published um, an article in, in open access, uh, many invasive surgery, an invited article where we're looking at uh, both robotic and laparoscopic use of um, ICG in ureters. 
very few uh, adverse effects. And when you look at the adverse effects, like 12 transient hematuria, it probably is related to having to put in stents because at the moment, the vast majority of people who employ ICG in the ureters do, throw, do so by injecting it through stents. We have heard of people putting spinal catheter, still requires cystoscopy, but putting a spinal catheter <clears throat> into the ureter and injecting the ICG and then taking it out. Uh, that is a possibility. So the transient hematuria and the ureteral stenosis <clears throat> and the prostatic bleeding are all related to the instrumentation, the cystoscopy and the stents. None of those complications are from the dive, from the ICG. So if we can get to the point that we can image ureters, as you and I and, and have done with Fernando Dip, where we've used different compounds that allow the ureters to be visualized without stents, then there's essentially no adverse effects, and we can visualize the ureters without stents. But that's the Achilles heel. Right now, we require catheterization, but what we need in the future are dyes that give ICG properties, but have renal excretion and minimize the need for stents. And, and as I say, I'm, I was trying to keep this on the shorter side as it talks, there's more time for discussion, but uh, you know, we've published in animal studies in that exact kind of model. Um, I don't know if there's other questions. You want me to stop before I talk about nerves? You're muted. When it comes to lymphangiography, I think there is a very large body of literature coming from the head and neck, breast oncology, breast surgical oncology, uh, where they're starting to use that for sentient lymph node on a routine basis. And Fernando and I were privileged to join our dear colleagues in Costa Rica this year to do a phenomenal uh, webinar uh, on oncology, surgical oncology, and they use it really routinely for melanoma, for breast cancer. Uh, Fernando, how about lymphangiography for colon cancer? How about for gastric cancer? And how much do you use it routinely in Argentina? Anyone on the call that wants to chime in, send me a signal and I open your microphone or, or read your question. Fernando? You go first. We don't use it, uh, sentinel lymph node identification, lymphangiography for uh, colorectal cancer, but uh, we do uh, routinely for breast cancer and for melanoma. This is for us a standard of care now, and we really replace the use of technetium. Uh, we recently sent for publication uh, together with ISFGS a meta-analysis that Kevin White put together that really analyzes the rate identification of um, the sentinel lymph node identification with ICG uh, versus magnesium and blue dye. Um, you know, we demonstrated that this is the same. We have the same, it's, it's so accurate that we don't need technetium anymore. So to your question, we use it uh, routinely for other applications, not colorectal. Nice. Let me ask uh, Dr. Pauline Eschbacher, who is a visiting uh, surgeon from the university's hospital in Bern, uh, Switzerland. Uh, Electra, if we can open her microphone from Dr. Eschbacher. She's a visiting professor from the uh, digestive disease department. Do you use fluorescent image guided surgery in Switzerland routinely uh, when doing colorectal surgery? You use it for lymph nodes, you use it for perfusion, or you don't use it at all? Paulina, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Perfect, speak up. Okay, so yeah, we use it routinely for perfusion, but not for lymph node in uh, colorectal surgery and also in uh, esophagectomy. For esophagectomy, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we got Dr. Onyate, uh, I don't know from where, but he has two comments. The one is from Professor Takemasa from Sapporo Medical University that published results on low anterior resections uh, on 2021 patients. These are randomized trials apparently with convincing, convincing results about the benefits of fluorescent guided surgery. And again, Ariel Onyate mentions that Michelle Diana in France is working on the quantitative evaluation. I can tell you that Medtronic's currently, and I have no conflict of interest, with Elevision, uh, they have a uh, system in place with quantitative analysis. You can touch on the screen and it will give you a number. 
so you can pair your assessment uh, with uh, fluorescent imaging and give it a number. To my knowledge, this is the only system on the market currently that can give you a quantitative analysis. We don't know what it means. Uh, Ariel Oñate from Mexico. Perfect. Bienvenido, Ariel. Disculpa la foto de Messi, okay? Um, any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, uh, I think we can uh, go to, to, to the nerve identification, Steve. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. So, you know, you, you speak about autofluorescence, um, and, and this is one where it's not auto, but, you know, it, it, it's ICG. It, it's done differently. It's giving four and a half milligrams per kilogram, 24 hours before surgery. It's given intravenous. These authors from China were able to visualize the splanchnic plexus, the, I, the inferior mesenteric artery, plexus, sacral nerve plexus. So these are important in colorectal surgery to be able to limit the potential for impotence and retrograde ejaculation and dyspyrunia in men and women respectively because of splanchnic nerve injury and uh, uh, nerves around the seminal vesicles, the, the bifurcation of the aorta. This could be a very helpful, but it's not ready for, for prime time yet, for sure. I think what we've been doing more of is peritoneal metastases and the International Society for uh, uh, Surgery of the Peritoneum um, has done quite a lot of work. Uh, uh, Delia cortez Garal, Olivia Sugavora uh, have done quite a bit on peritoneal carcinomatosis. Um, there's not numbers the same as for perfusion, but there certainly are getting to be numbers. So uh, 71 patients, 353 peritoneal nodules, you can see the sensitivity and specificity, but what's really important in this area, unlike a colon resection that you're still gonna do, or unlike colonic nodes that you're still gonna take, intervention changed in 25% and in 29% of patients based on ICG. That is huge. I showed you the way our margins changed in a few percent of people. Here you're talking 25% to 29%. So you know the idea that you can see better, you have clear visualization of peritoneal nodules, you can get an R0 resection much better because you can see those nodules. And specifically, you can look at some sensitivities of 97 to 100% and some specificities of 100% too. So with time and with the learning curve and with some uh, refinement, I think if you're going to do uh, peritoneal surface malignancy work and you're going to do debulking, um, then for sure you need to be using ICG. Uh, this is a single center prospective trial from my, my dear friend, uh, Antonio Lacey and his son, Borja, and the rest of the team at Hospital Clinic in Barcelona. Um, they gave the ICG 12 hours rather than a day before, and they correlated a sensitivity and specificity of 181 units. So this is what we were talking about with quantification or perfusion, that you get a number that means something. So their number with that methodology was 181 units in their quantification scale might be, again, might be the threshold of malignancy. And you can see the sensitivity and specificity versus an uptake of 100 is benign. So now when we can do that for perfusion, that's a home run. That's a grand slam. That's, a, that's the World Cup trophy, right? That's, that's it. Because you say, I'm not, I don't have to worry here or I do have to worry here. The problem is this one is binary. So it's either malignant or it's not malignant. Those are your two choices. With an anastomotic leak, it's more than binary. It's did you mobilize the splenic flexure? Did you divide the inferior mesenteric vein at the duodenum? Did you divide the inferior mesenteric artery at the aorta? Did you mobilize the rectum to help free things up? Was the anastomosis hemostatic? There's a lot of other factors. Did you join two bits of healthy bowel together or was one end radiated or was one end diverticular? Uh, muscular hypertrophy, or was one end um, got ulcerative colitis or Crohn? So there's all these other factors that make the quantification harder because if you get a, let's say this were true in colorectal, and you had 100 uh, unit below 100, well, it's the other way around. Let's say above 181, you say it's not going to leak, but then it leaked. Well, why did it leak? Well, because you didn't mobilize the flexure or because you anastomosed disease bowel. So it becomes more complicated. 
But this instance, I think, is great for quantification. And the same is true, by the way, for liver metastases. And just yesterday, uh, I had the opportunity to operate, or two days ago, with, with Mank Roy, one of our uh, HPB surgeons, who had injected ICG the day before. And you could see those liver mets glow. And it was more accurate than the intrahepatic ultrasound. So in this instance, again, using a review of 13 articles, uh, it, it, from the group in Italy, you can see what the dose is, and not just a day before surgery, but up to two weeks before surgery, um, that you start to see, and I saw this with my own eyes this week, tiny little occult lesions that did not show up on preoperative image and did not show up on um, intraoperative ultrasound that you could see as bright green on the liver. Granted, the ones deep in the parenchyma, you're not going to see that way. But certainly the surface lesions, you will see that way. Um, this study is, a, is a, a randomized control trial, 64 patients, 32 in each group. And the ICG group uh, was, uh, or the surgeons found in the ICG group, more lesions. And those patients had, interestingly, presumably because of a uh, more thorough resection, a lower recurrence rate. Uh, in these patients. Here's another study, uh, 15 patients, again, small series, um, but 77% were resected, uh, were detected, of the resected mess were detected by ultrasound, but it got up to 90% when used both intraoperative ultrasound and ICG. So in almost half of patients, near-infrared fluorescence imaging facilitated the surgical technique by allowing surgeons to see better imaging these small superficial liver mets that are missed by standard techniques. So I mentioned before, maybe this video will play, my standard practice. And my standard practice is ureteric visualization with ICG, as you can see here, perfusion assessment, as you can see here. So I'm going to take an area right in here that's going to be where my purse string is, not at the transition point, but proximal to the transition point. And this is a view, um, um, just see a second, anastomotic perfusion intraoperative, so you can see endoscopic, okay? So quadruple assessment, donuts, flexible sigmoidoscopy, air insufflation underwater, and ICG. It's done for all patients. And you know, time doesn't permit in the remaining 15 minutes to go into all of these articles, but uh, it was a real privilege for the finale of the year to have our publication from ISFGS in surgery. I'm just gonna leave this up a second so people can see the different works that were done by Fernando and, and Raul, again, with the help of, of Kevin White and Electra McDermott. Just an absolutely spectacular article. Every single, thanks to Diagnostic Green, um, thanks to Diagnostic Green, every article is free access. So you can download every single article from this issue, and I encourage you to do so, because what I've spoken about tonight is really just the tip of the iceberg. You start delving into these various expert statements, and you'll really get a complete education in uh, fluorescence-guided surgery, uh, as well as the... Um, overall Delphi analysis. So we had 35 international experts, 69 total statements, um, and high consensus, high consensus for use in training in, in colorectal surgery. So I'll take that down because I'd rather have some more time. And that's why I didn't put many slides in here. I tried to keep this more uh, a time for conversation and question answers rather than surely didactic. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, Jonathan Zorger is asking, how comfortable would you be giving the patient 4.5 milligrams per kilogram? Uh, that's oh, a great, yeah, that's a great question, Jonathan, and, and uh, uh, greetings to you in, in California. Um, I, I don't have a problem knowing how non-toxic it is. Um, again, I always question patients in advance. Do you have allergies to shellfish or iodine? But I, I don't have a problem with the dose. And, and again, it, again, I suppose it depends when, because it, during a general anesthetic, the patient's in a controlled setting. If you're going to do this in your office, uh, intravenous 
pre-op for like hepatic imaging, <clears throat> you might at least be conscious to be in some kind of near monitor setting. But I, but I, I, I do have a high comfort level. And when you think about, um, you know, what the benefits are compared to the potential risks, I think the benefits outweigh the risks. Yeah. I have Michael Bouvet, who is the chief of endocrine surgery at UCSD and also past president of ISFGS, a great surgeon and clinician and academician. Mike, what do you think about that dosage? And based on our consensus, do you think that we would have some sort of problems in injecting so much, knowing that ICG has a very, very low uh, incidence of allergic reactions. Mike Bouvet, can you hear us? Electra, can you open Michael's microphone? Okay, can you hear me? Uh, yes. We can hear you and we can see you, at least your pick. Uh oh, that's scary. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree, Mike. <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't given the high dose ICG myself, but I mean, they do it all the time in Japan and other centers in the United States, for, especially for the liver mets. And one time we gave 10 cc's or 25 milligrams of ICG by mistake in the pre-op area before lap coli and the patient did fine. There was no adverse effect. Um, that was a, just a, a misunderstanding. I think the resident and the anesthesiologist uh, gave the full amount and, and everything was fine. So I have sort of a limited experience with the high dose, but so far so good. From what I've read, uh, it seems to be safe as long as you don't have the iodine allergy. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm impressed to hear Steve's personal experience of seeing those small liver mets uh, with just 24 hours before surgery getting the ICG. That's pretty exciting. Um, and we should really be using this all the time, I think, for that kind of operation. Yeah, yeah I, I agree, Michael. I agree. I have a question, Steve. How much correlation have we done with lymph node status in patients with liver metastases? Because, you know, it's not so much the lymphangiography. If you would do ICG intraoperatively and you see a liver met, you can say that this is automatically someone that has a positive lymph node. Uh, how many patients with positive lymph node do not have a liver metastasis? Do we have correlation which staging liver metastasis showed up? Well, I, I don't think we have that level of granular detail. I can tell you the majority of people who are node positive or hepatic metastasis negative, in other words, N1 or N2 disease or M0 disease. Um, and conversely, you have people who are N0 who are, sorry, this is in the middle of my screen, isn't it? You have people who are M1, but N0. So you can certainly skip the nodes as well, which is which I think in my mind is one of the many reasons to highlight why ICG should be routinely used because you can't just rely on lymph node status. Yeah, we got two other comments and questions. Uh, again, Jonathan from San Diego from California. Sunil Singal has done a lot of this at Penn to inject 4.5 per kilogram. And there is just a regulatory indications of, of use issue with that. Uh, Michael Constantinidis from Athens, Kalispera, Kala. Thank you for your extremely educational talks and presentation. I would like to ask if you routinely mark tumors preoperatively with ICG and what method do you exactly use? Steve? For, for tumors? Yeah, would you mark a tumor with ICG, inject the tumor with ICG? No, because at the moment, it's not one of the FDA labeled indications here. And it's one thing injecting it in a ureter that is, ureter that is excreted. It's another thing bringing the patient for an additional colonoscopy to inject uh, the lesion, as is done by, for example, Manish Chand and others in the UK where it's allowed. So we have a kind of regulatory issue on that one, um, number one. Number two, um, to inject the tumor, I'm not sure I understand the point of it because the, you can see and feel the tumor. If it's such a small lesion or somebody, an endoscopist resected a polyp thinking it might be malignant, they have already applied clips or injected into your ink. So uh, you're going to be able to identify the primary lesion. Yeah. The question is, you would inject it to see the lymph nodes. And as I already mentioned, I'm not a fan of that because I'm already doing a high ligation. So unlike 
the margin on perfusion assessment that might be changed by ICG, my decision as to the level of, of ligation of the artery in the vein will not change based on ICG, so, so I don't do it. Um, but I, well, I do, if I may, if I may interject, and sorry to interrupt, you feel comfortable with high ligation because that's what you can see, and that's how we work. But what if I show you that despite doing high ligation in 20% of your cases, there are some lymph nodes somewhere else that you can pick and take out and happen to be positive. Don't you think that you might improve outcomes? Yes, except that that's not been borne out by the literature to date with ICG or prior to ICG with radioimmunoguided surgery or uh, lymphazurin and methylene blue and others. I mean, nobody has shown that yet uh, in, in any, in any of, of the studies with any of the agents. Which brings us to the point that was mentioned before uh, by Michael. Uh, we are not using things routinely because of the literature. And I remember when I work at Cedar sinai with Jeremy Swan and Willie Gantz, they said if they would have waited for their catheter results to be statistically significant, they would have never patented that. Uh, right. So I mean, it's, that's correct. what we're doing. That's what we are doing the Delphi surveys, because if we wait for the literature, you know, it's going to be too late. We're going to miss so many opportunities to help our patients. Right. Well, um, the, the issue of ICG is twofold. Number one, we certainly have not waited for any literature because to date, with the exception of the excellent Japanese trial by Professor uh, Takamasa, with the exception of that trial, there is no randomized control trial showing benefits of ICG yet it's been part of routine clinical practice for the last 10 years. So we're certainly not waiting for data. Uh, we're way ahead of the data curve in routinely using it and considering it a standard of care, number one. Uh, number two, the reason people tend to inject ICG is not to take more tissue, or one of the reasons, but to take less, to say, well, maybe I don't need to do high ligation because the nodes are all negative and they're reliably negative. So why am I taking them out, right? But the reason one does a high ligation is for length, to have a tension-free anastomosis. So that's my point. You're going to be taking all those nodes anyway to have a tension-free anastomosis. Yeah. Well, Steve, you are at the high level of the American College of Surgeons, American Board of Surgery. Why doesn't ASCRS, the American College of Surgeons, come out with some sort of statement, uh, you know, endorsing fluorescent image guided surgery, I won't say in colorectal surgery alone, but in all specialties. Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly something that the education committee, and I know you're certainly a part of that, that group, uh, could look at. Um, generally, the ACS wouldn't offer practice guidelines, practice parameters. Societies like SAGES might, and the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons might. Um, I would say that in general, neither of those societies, having been president of both of them, neither of them have, have practiced parameters that address specifically techniques. They usually address, they have in the past, laparoscopy and, and robotics, but generally speaking, they address diseases or operations, right? So as pra practice parameters start to evolve, and you will see this in the ASCRS, that as people talk about the practice parameters for rectal cancer, there, is, there will be language that says fluorescence imaging is part of an astomatic assessment. So it won't be a separate standard on fluorescence imaging, but it will be within the context of a rectal cancer. Or maybe when SAGES is writing about esophagectomy and, and such, it'll be in a SAGES standard. Uh, we're getting at the top of the hour. Uh, it's been a phenomenal review. Um, I'm going to see Fernando Dip has any other final comment or question for you. I see there is another question that came in through the chat. Um, Fernando, any final comments? Oh, my last my last question to Stevie is uh, for someone that is starting what is basically the learning curve that someone needs in order to really understand the technology. The learning curve for this, I mean, here we're talking about laparoscopy and robots and transanal total mesorectal excision and the lateral pelvic node dissection. The learning curve for this in terms of difficulty on a scale of one to 100 is one. I mean, this is about as simple as anything you could possibly do. 
You ask the anesthesiologist, give the ICG, flush. You count to you know, 30 or whatever, and you turn on the near infrared imaging and you look at the screen. The biggest problem is troubleshooting the equipment. I mean, interpreting the ICG is easy. It's green, like I showed in the video. The more difficult part is when you've got a nurse or a technician who's plugged things in wrong or programmed them wrong or turned them off or something. So the troubleshooting of the hardware, that's a never ending learning curve because you know in many operating rooms now in the United States, we have nurses who work with you today, with me tomorrow, with Dr. Bouvet the next day and the following day uh, you know, with uh, somebody else. So that's the bigger problem. The ICG itself is is literally the easiest thing you can possibly learn. Michael Bouvet, final comments from UCSD. Um, no, it was a great uh, discussion. I really enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, I just get more excited about uh, the topic every time we talk about it and use, you know, use these fluorescent techniques in the OR uh, to visualize structures. And really, it comes down to making surgery safer and avoiding complications. That's what it's all about. Uh, so it's really going to benefit the patients ultimately. 100% agree. Well, Steve, without any other comments, I want to thank everyone for participating. I want to take this opportunity to invite everyone again on Sunday to watch Argentina become the world champion. And thank Electra for putting together these webinars all year long, Fernando for your strong work, and wishing everyone a happy holiday season, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, and a happy and healthy 2023. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.